Welcome, guys. Remember how you all said that you were going to like, comment, and subscribe? Well, it's come to my attention that many of you haven't done that, and I think you should really think about the morality of your actions on this occasion. Just take a look in the mirror and ask yourself, is that fair behaviour when I'm bringing you all this content for free? I don't think it is. Welcome, guys. This is called Passive Aggressive Poker. I'm just kidding, by the way. You can like or subscribe or comment if you want to. You don't have to. I'd love to hear from you if you want to. I was doing my passive aggressive impression. Passive aggression is something I'm actually really bad at. I don't, I try to make a habit of not being that way in real life because I think it's kind of like in some ways worse than just actually being outright aggressive. Not that I try to do that either. But the point is that in this poker session of 200 Zoom that I played this morning, I noticed that I was basically playing very aggressively in some spots and very passively in others. Not too aggressive, not too passive. These are terms that we should absolutely banish from our poker vocabulary because they lead to these arbitrary, harsh judgments about play that are altogether removed from what you're actually doing and the true EV of your actions. So today I'm going to show you where really passive looking lines can be great and where really aggressive looking lines can be great. And I'm going to alternate between a passive hand and an aggressive hand. This is a cool pot I played against regular Chaps1998, who I believe is a, he used to be a coach for sure, on Run At Once, where I also produce content sometimes. And I'm not sure if he still is or whatever, but yeah, definitely a solid player that, that knows what he's doing. So we go ahead and open 2.5x on the button here with Ace4, we get a call from Chaps in the big blind and we flop top pair. So here you can play a big bet strategy or a small bet strategy. The way most human beings elect to play the spot is to use B33, meaning betting like third pot or quarter pot and just doing it with everything. And that's simple, it's easy, it avoids a headache. And if you've studied in that way, there's no problem with you doing that. I would never sit here and tell students play the way I play. You know, it's not the only way to play, but the way I do play the spot is with a more aggressive strategy in the sense that when I do bet, it will be bigger, but it's a more passive strategy in the sense that I'm not betting my range and I'll be checking much more often than I would be if I was using a small range bet strategy, of course, where I bet 100% of the time. So I roll a check this time. I think my hand is just mixing around 50-50 bet and check here. I don't know the frequency. I'm not a solver. I'm not a savant. I don't claim to have the solver internalized. So I just pick a rough frequency that seems right and I go for it. Come at me, solver nerds. Come at me in the comments. At least I'll get you to comment that way. Villain decides to overbet the turn. This is a really good play. Just to understand briefly why Villain does this, because there's a lot of misconceptions about this spot that people just don't really understand. One, Villain has a big range disadvantage here, and no, that is not a contradiction with their sizing. Villain's sizing is based around the value region that they're choosing to bet with. When you have a large range disadvantage because the texture favours your opponent, in this case the button opener, you want to go ahead and bet with a fairly low frequency with just a really nutty value region. And if you're not leading here with like Ace-8 or Ace-5 or something like that or King-10, then there's no reason why you can't just go really big with a sub range of something like Ace Jack plus. So I'd imagine that's what Villain is doing. They're also going to have plenty of bluffs, things like Queen Jack, straight draws, flush draws, lower cards like 7 5, things like this as well. Could be in there sometimes, although I think Villain has to be a little selective on this node. I don't think they can just take like King 4 of spades and do this. That's going to be a losing play. And the reason for that is that the fold equity that they get from Button here in GTO is actually slightly less than what we call the pot odds norm, the, the normal amount for the pot odds if everything else was neutral. But because we have a range advantage and we're in position, we actually get to over defend our range frequency wise a little bit here. Clearly A6 unblocking every bluff into the sun, having top pair blocking two pair is just going to be a really easy call. When I say unblocking bluffs, I mean that we don't have a card like a 7-8 jack, queen, king, something that would block more villain's bluffing range, the king to a lesser extent. We river two pair here and villain does something again here that's really good and instructive that I want to show you. They go for the gigantic bet, which is a lovely thing to do in this situation because if you think about it, we have capped our range by checking back on the flop. We would appear bet our sets and two pairs and stuff there and many of our 7-8 combos as well. On the turn, therefore, villain has 7-8. They have pocket sixes. They have possibly something like a6 as well, they have these kind of value region. They have this sort of value region that just is capable of going for a really big bet here. So after overbetting turn, this should absolutely be villain's most common chosen size on the river. It makes a ton of sense. I think when you've rivered two pair, you want to be calling here. And the reason for that is that when you have two cards that are connected to the board, even though I don't block tremendous amounts of villain's value range with this combo, and I would love to have a six or something that blocked the set instead, it's still going to be nifty for me to avoid blocking the dangler cards. That's like the loose cards that missed their draws. 
So the fact that I don't have a jack, queen, eight or seven in my hand here is really good. So two pair here is a call, not because it beats any of villain's value region, I don't think, although maybe they could play something like 10-9 this way, I suppose, but mostly just because I don't think they do play 10 9 this way for this sizing, though I could be wrong, maybe they do. But mainly just because I leave all of those cards unblocked, all of that bluffing range unblocked. So I think this is one we definitely want to call. I called here without too much thought. I just think if we're folding this one, then we're probably folding like one of the best bluff catchers in our entire range, if it's even restricted to only being a bluff catcher. Maybe we chop with like ace four? No, probably not. Villain doesn't have that. Villain doesn't have pocket fours. But yeah, it's, it's still a very, very good call. It's a winning call in theory, and this is a player that I fully expect to be capable of bluffing. You may notice as well that Villain has these two diamonds. Is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? Usually having two diamonds is not a good thing, but on the ace high board here, they're actually blocking our combos of ace five and ace deuce of diamonds, which I think are going to be pretty good hands for us to bluff catch with. So I actually think this, this over bet's probably fine with these two specific diamonds. Villain would want to avoid doing that with like the queen of diamonds or something of that nature. I guess it's kind of bad that he does block like queen five, king deuce and king five of diamonds, which are easy folds now. So maybe this has a little bit of a stretch, like it's a little bit of an over bluff maybe, but I don't think it's like horrible and villain sizing scheme here really does demonstrate how you should be playing this spot. So I guess what I'm doing here is I'm kind of more praising villain than me, but I am saying that the passive line I took does lead to taking advantage of this part of villain's range that decides to bluff. You don't make this amount of money from a hand like deuce five if you just go bet, bet, bet. Not to say there's anything wrong with betting the flop, there's not. It's just that you need to see what you're actually losing out on sometimes by taking an aggressive line. There's a lot of aggression bias in the poker community where when in doubt people are just really biased saying that you should bet when checked to rather than check back and I think that's largely because people really miss the benefits of checking behind. Let's look at a different hand now. As I said, we're going to be going passive aggressive today, so looking at a passive line and then an aggressive line. I'll also throw some insults into you guys in the chat as well, into the, the comment section. If you want to insult me back with passive aggression, that's fine. Maybe we could even have a contest to see who can be the most passive aggressive in the comments. If I call it the chat, it's because I've been streaming on my Twitch channel, Kara underscore corner. Do check it out, sub there, follow there if you haven't already. I appreciate all the support there as well. Queen 10 of hearts here in the small blind, we go for an open, we face a 3-bet from what looks to be some kind of recreational player. I've given them the sort of fuchsia pink tag here, I believe that's what you call that, or is it magenta, I never remember. But this is a tag I give people who are generally quite active. I considered for quite some time whether I should just start donk betting this flop, I thought that 654 two-tone was incredibly good for my range, like when I flat the 3-bet here, but then I remembered. This is big blind, theoretically at least they are meant to have more of these small cards in this configuration, because they just have bluffs like that. However, then I realized that with the weaker player, probably they're constructed more linearly and I could have dunk bet, but I don't really care. I think checking and letting them define their range by betting big with too many over pairs, checking back too unprotected is a good thing to do. I make this small bet just with range effectively, like I think I've gained a significant advantage at this point and I can begin just leading a lot with pair plus for value denial and then throwing in loads of random pair drop bluffs like the Queen 10 that are still kind of live. On the river, I had to think about my value region here and I thought, well, I'm going to have some flushes, I'm going to have some boats. All of those combos are really abundant and they're going to look to overbet. So I eventually ended up deciding just to overbet this hand. I thought I could also have some other hands here, like at seven, that maybe wanted to bet small, but they can probably bet this size as well. I basically landed on the thought that I don't have a lot of value bets that want to bet any smaller than this. So lines like block in this spot just seem a bit too thin. Lines like big bet seem like no man's landish, like they're not really capturing any of my value region. So I figured that given that all straights, flushes and boats were just gonna overbet and those were by far the most common thing in my range for value, I would just overbet every bluff and just keep it simple. So I overbet this hand. Well unfolded and I think it's gonna be a spot that's really difficult for my opponent to defend optimally and they're not gonna have a seven very often at all. They're not gonna be probably checking enough over pair on the flop. They're gonna get there with way too many hands like ace x with a club, but I don't just wanna go after those hands. I also want to try and get fold equity from the pair region from eights or nines or jacks or aces or whatever in villain's range as well. And so I think the over bet is just a classic sizing in theory here and it didn't see a reason to deviate. So this is a spot that calls for absolute aggression because our range is doing well. Not only is our range doing well equity wise overall, which makes us want to bluff freely and frequently, but also the value region that we most commonly bet here is going to be incredibly strong and therefore the large sizing with that polarization slash nut advantage is going to be the chosen one. If you're wondering why I'm wearing this hat, 
the reason is twofold. One, my hair is an absolute mess right now. Two, it's cold in here. And actually it's threefold. Three, my girlfriend said the other day that I look quite nice in hats. So maybe now I'll just start wearing hats to earn her approval and avoid passive aggression. Yeah guys, just kidding. She's not usually passive aggressive. I'm gonna stop talking in case she watches this video. Let's continue. So ace 10 offsuit here, we get a board of queen queen six blind versus blind. There's actually passivity and aggression both contained within this one hand, so it's really instructive for our theme today. We go for small bet here, I'm just betting range. You can bet a little bit less often than that if you want and like start splitting, but I think this is a board that's big Broadway pair is favorable enough for the small blind. The king gives us this sort of situation where we lose our range advantage right upon betting flop and getting called because villain is filtering away from air and we're not really doing that. However, what's happened next is that the king is such a good card for us because they would have folded a lot of their king 7, king 5, king 8, king 4 on the flop and we still have all of ours. Of course, both players are going to have hands like king 10, king jack here. They're a little bit too big to fold, but we have a monopoly on the king x here. That's going to boost our equity upward a little bit, but it doesn't mean that we have a nut advantage. Remember, our opponent in the first hand we looked at today was supposed to overbet the turn with a nut advantage because they were just basically value betting very strong stuff. But here we're value betting a range that's a bit mergier. It has things like king x, aces, etc. in it. And we don't want to bet a range like that for an overbet into a range that can still contain a queen. So we just go for this sizing, which is the right theoretical choice in the spot. I think with a 10 of diamonds, you want to bet more often than normal. That's just because you're eating up the diamonds. The hands are going to raise you, attack you, make your life difficult later. They're still live at this point. They still have a lot of equity and probably a hand like 10, 9 of diamonds will win the pot from us one way or another really frequently when we have ace-10, even though ace-10 is a better hand than 10-9. 10-9 with a flush draw is going to bluff river after we check if neither player improves and then win that way, or they're going to hit a flush and win that way. So we do want to block those combos there's a bit of confusion about that sometimes, but yeah, this is going to be a high frequency. I guess hybrid bet, we can get called by a similar hand and still win sometimes. We can get fives to fold. Maybe we even get called by like the jack nine of diamonds, which we're doing well against, or jack seven of diamonds or something. But like I say, it's going to be tough to win against those hands without improving. So quite a complex spot in the turn, but I do think bet is okay on the king. On a card like a five or a seven, our hand would be a bit too high up in terms of showdown value. Our showdown value does decrease there. I don't know if you noticed, but Villain's turn call was extremely quick here, very, very fast. And I think what that's really going to do, well, first off, we should definitely utilize that. I think people are way too neglectful of timing tells these days. They're a very valuable source of information. And what they allow you to do is narrow down an online poker player's range further than you could just with the knowledge of like that player or like GTO or theory or the spot or whatever. So when Villain calls really quickly, the type of hand I expect to be more prevalent is something like a draw, busted diamond draw, something like that, something like Jack-10, something like King X, some easy call that's just like very straightforward to make. I think the kind of call that's going to be less prevalent now is something like pocket fives, pocket eights, maybe six x. These hands require a little bit more thought. So hands that are draws and hands that are already quite good but not amazing are definitely going to be clustered at a higher density now in our opponent's range because of this turn timing tell. What that means is that if we weren't already really incentivized to give up this holding due to having the negative 10 of diamonds blocker, we're even more incentivized to give up that holding holding now. So I think this is a really no-brainer check. Villain checks back and he does have one of the hands we're kind of thinking are more likely now, a draw. Just so happens that this draw did have showdown value, that was its main MO for calling turn to go with the gutter and we don't beat that one but that's okay. There's plenty of ace of diamonds we do beat here that Villain is checking back and we're winning against and of course we're also just going to be cutting our losses against that king x region etc by just giving up here. Villain does make it to the river with plenty of backdoor king x hands that called flop or flush draw with a king or even just brute force king jack that's got enough showdown value and improvability to peel the flop every time. Here we have a hand where we truly get to combine passivity with aggression in one street, let alone just one hand. What I love to do in spots like this is just to check out of position. I've been cold called. My range has a lot of like clumsy, cluttery hands like the King Queen of Hearts and the Ace 10 offsuit with no club and things like that. So it's going to be kind of struggling here. It's also going to have the monopoly on hands like the King 8 of Hearts and Ace 7 of Spades and things like this that are just really trashy here. So no doubt we get here with a really weak, trashy range in many respects, though we do have some really strong hands as well. On the other hand, Villain's a bit more condensed to like pairs and broadways that are suited and things like that, at least in theory. But because this was a recreational player, it was an unknown, I decided that I would just go with a check raise here every single time. This takes advantage of the fact that people are used to just getting their way with a bet here. If you're a recreational, you normally play like 1-3 live or something. 
and you sit down at the, the golden nugget i think it only runs one too but anyway you sit down in like some soft casino like this and or anywhere in the world that's live that's low stakes and someone checks to you here um, and you bet your bet will work like very very often so it's almost like a cultural norm now. It's just like completely standardized to bet here for weaker players and do very well by betting here. So I expect to get stabbed at way too merged, way too wide here. I'm going to go ahead and raise. I'm going to keep applying pressure depending on timing and stuff later. There's just a lot of a lot to say about just raising here. If I do get like jammed on or something, of course, it's a real shame. But then a lot of the hands that jam on me will be like the ace of clubs or nut flush or something anyway. But yeah, I think that's a great lesson there. Just combining a bit of passivity with a bit of aggression checking to open the door to like outlandish betting and then punishing it with a check raise as long as your hand has something going for it in a spot like that is going to be fine my hand is, is more than good enough in this hand we've gone ahead and opened the ace king of spades we've got a cold call and then a squeeze on the button so this this squeeze is obviously very small i had this player tagged as like some kind of maniac in fact i think i clicked on them to see a note and the note read utter maniac or something like that I wonder if that's actually on screen. Maybe it was a different moment in time that I looked at that. But yeah, I definitely saw that I'd written Utter Maniac on this player. If you're watching this, sir or madam, please don't take offense. I just I just write down what I see. Maybe you did something a bit crazy. So let me just talk through this bet size here. I just decided to make it like one sixth pot around there. And the reason for that is that I don't have to rush pot growth whatsoever at this stacked pot ratio. Secondly, the more room I give a player like this to just do something silly, the more money I'm going to make. So this is actually a form of passivity by not betting like third pot or half pot or what many of you guys might just decide to bet here. And that you may auto just see a bit bigger. You may worry that like villain can have some draws here and you want to like price them out or stop villain realizing equity. You can't actually stop a flush draw from profitably calling your bet here unless you jam and you're not really going to want to. Okay, I exaggerate slightly, but you're not going to want to tailor your entire strategy to just stopping villain's draws getting that good of a price. You need to think about maximization the times that you're really far ahead because those times are super important. What happens when villain has a hand that has like 45 or 50% equity against you is really meaningless. Like if villain has queen jack of hearts here, how the money goes in, if it goes in, when it goes in, none of these things really matter because those hand that hand is so close with you anyway. It's chopping, it's flipping. It doesn't really matter. It's just a roll the dice kind of gamble situation. That's okay. Poker's full of those spots. What really does matter here is the times that villain has like the king eight of clubs and you bet half pot and he folds. That's a real shame, at least by betting really small here. I open the door to those hands doing something. So there's not a big difference here between betting really small and checking in terms of theory. But the advantage of the small bet is that I just get to like sometimes insult and offend and sort of trigger maniacal emotional players into doing something whereas the check is a bit less likely to do that in my opinion it does vary from human to human of course but i consider this bet a completely sound theoretical thing to do that also happens to be exploitatively very powerful against this kind of foe so we go for this we do get jammed on we're snapping here we're not doing this the fold they have the six seven of hearts so they got a bit out of line pre-flop a bit too wide there and in this occasion they happen to pay the price god on boys and girls I think this is the second time in this video we've had these four of clubs. I don't know if I butchered this a little bit. I'm actually not too sure. This is a hand that kind of confuses me a bit. So ace, 10, deuce. We flatted button versus big blind. I think if villain is small blind here, you can start four betting this combo. It feels a bit too good to me to squander as a four bet. In this situation, I'd rather four bet like the king four suited or the ace six suited or something. It's not quite so juicy as a flat. I contemplated playing small raise here. I decided I would play some small raise and just sort of make life a bit more difficult for villain. I, I could make some bets when checked through here, so the fact that they've bet like one eighth pot doesn't really deter me from making bets, i.e. raising. So building a raising range, I don't even mind raising this hand and then checking back turn and going from there, but I decided to call this time based on the RNG. Bill and checks turn, I decided I would just build a strategy of about B75 for kind of a lowish frequency and usually check back. I just think that there's not a great deal of point in betting ace four here. I could and then check back river, but I decided I would just play a river and allow villain to make some mistakes there, hopefully out of position that's just a little bit harder for them to play this node well than it is for me. So inviting the node with ace four seems good. We get quarter pot. I think against this particular sizing, we should never be losing in game theory. Like very, very rarely. Okay, maybe villain can slow play like aces or something like this exactly. But other than that, I think ace king, ace queen is just always going to be betting bigger. I think ace jack should be betting bigger as well. This is just such a bad sizing with those hands after we check back turn because we're mostly condensed. We're no mostly not raising the river very often here. But I do think with something like ace four, in game theory terms, we should be able to raise because the idea is that villain has mostly kings, queens, jacks, and 10x. So I think raising here is fine. In hindsight, I don't think I did butcher this. I wondered at the time like whether this was going to be too thin or not, but I don't actually think it should be. I think it should be okay. 
I did think for a while I won't make you watch like all of my ruminating here, but yeah, I decided to go for this and my opponent folded fairly quickly in, in this occasion. So I'd imagine they, they either had some kind of bluff, which is fine to do this with as well. I just started talking about this in Cash Injection, my course coming out on December 16th, about how you can actually take some really cool small bet lines and yield way more fold equity than you're meant to get and just perform really well because of that. So I hope you guys have found this video useful. It's been a fun one to make. There is a time and a place for passivity. There's a time and a place for aggression. And what you don't want to become is a biased poker player that really just thinks about one side of the coin and is really drawn to like either aggressive lines or passive lines for some reason because they feel good or they feel right. Make sure you are objectively apprehending the gains, the disadvantages of both of these types of play and that you, you understand that there's nothing inherently right about aggression or inherently wrong about passivity as long as you sort of think specifically. Poker is a specific game in which you have to engage with every exact situation. So as I said, our course Cash Injection is dropping on December 16th if you're watching this after that in 2022 or you're watching this in, the, in 2023 or some other time in the distant future. The course is live on CarrotCorner.com. You can pick it up there and you can check out everything else that we offer on CarrotCorner.com. Please do let us know what you think about this format, about this video in the comments, and I'll see you for the next one. Good luck, guys, and I'll talk to you later. Bye for now.